In the January 20th, uh, let me try that again, January 2021, Tomorrow's World, I wrote an article, Three Pillars of Stability in Difficult Times. And I wrote that to try to be very encouraging to everyone because these are difficult times. They're not the most difficult times that the world has ever seen, even though it seems that our populations think it's the most difficult time, but those who lived through World War II, especially those who were in, in uh, Germany or Southeast, uh, not Germany, but Europe in general, yes, Germany too, but uh, in Europe, those in Russia, those in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, those were difficult times, difficult times that would far exceed what we're experiencing right now. Even the 1918 pandemic was uh, far more traumatic and a lot of ways when you look at how many people died from that. But as the people of today, we uh, seem to obsess with how difficult and how awful and how terrible our lives tend to be when we have so many wonderful things going for us. But nevertheless, it doesn't help to know that somebody else had it worse when things are difficult for us as individuals. We do need a foundation upon which to stand and I wrote that article trying to give our readers as well as our members uh, three points, three pillars that will help us during difficult times. Those pillars were know that God exists, really know that there is a God in heaven and that he does care for us, he does love us, he is working out a purpose, a plan here below, and all this isn't just left up to total chance. Uh, the second one was to prove that the Bible is the Word of God, because that's where we have the source of knowledge and understanding, not only of God, but of how to live and uh, what life is all about and the purpose for life. And the third pillar was to know where God is working, to really prove where God is working. Now, these three pillars have been, for me, very important, and I know that we often cover these in baptism counseling, not with everybody, I suppose, but many of you had those things covered during your um, baptism counseling. To really know that God exists, and with young people who've grown up in the church, that's one of the points that I want to, to make sure that people understand, that do you really believe that God exists? Can you prove it to yourself? Well, if you grow up quote, believing that God exists, that's fine, but have you ever been challenged by it? And what happens with many young people when they go off to university and they sit there with their biology professor who is trashing God and making fun of God in some cases, as I've heard from individuals who've experienced it or have had a relative experience it, a professor will come out there and literally shake his fist at God and challenge God to strike him dead if he exists. And I've watched personally at Ventura College where someone comes in believing in God and by the end of the first semester they've trashed God as well because that professor was able to convince them that God doesn't exist, that we all evolved. Because they didn't have a really strong foundation in knowing and proving that God exists. Now if you really have that strong foundation, you have nothing to worry about. But have you proved it to yourself? Our young people, have you proved that the Bible is truly the Word of God? And for all of us, have we proved that this is where God is working? That's very important. I was just trying to think of some of the crises. I was thinking about this last night. Some of the things that we've gone through over the years. And those of, have been, who've, of us who have been in the church for decades have been challenged on many different occasions. We had certain issues in 1972 and in 1974. I won't go into the details of them, but we, we lost in 1974 about 30 ministers and 3,000 people from the Worldwide Church of God because of problems that existed. And those problems were not just imagined. There were some real problems there. And it was a very difficult time. And then in the 70s, we had a... Uh, an apostasy, a, a watering down of things. And Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Herbert Armstrong had a heart attack and he came back in 1979 and he came back after praying for God to give him the strength to set the church back on track and really crying out to God and he did. But as soon as Mr. Armstrong was, was uh, dead, 
Then his successors began to move the church in a very different direction, and those who lived through the time of 1993 to, or actually from about 1990 to 1995, found it a very troubling, difficult time because the leaders of the church were basically saying that everything we've believed is wrong and that the Protestant world is where we ought to be. Now, they didn't say it in those words, but that's really the gist of it all, and time has proven that to be the case. And then even after we came out to do the work of God, some of us to assist Mr. Meredith. Uh, Dr. Meredith, uh, I came in 1995, and within a few years we had individuals that wanted to overthrow him. They didn't like the way he was doing it. And we had that disruption that took place. And we've had several disruptions since that time. But knowing that God exists, knowing that the Bible is the Word of God, and knowing what the Bible says about the doctrines of, of the church, what they should be, and knowing where to find that church based on those doctrines has been a solid foundation certainly for me, and I hope it has been for, I would assume it's been for some of you, and I hope that it will be for all of our, our members. And again, I, I don't want to overly focus on our young people, but these are things that you have to prove. It's not good enough that mom and dad have done this because you can find millions of people who have followed mom and dad and believe that what mom and dad taught was absolutely correct. And I'm talking about religion. I'm not talking about other things. Let me just talk about religion. There are Muslims, there are Catholics, there are Protestants who grow up that way, and they believe based on, you know, mom and dad, they couldn't be wrong about this. Even though they often go away from it, they come back to it later on. You need to know why you are here. Mr. Herbert Armstrong used to emphasize that. Why are we here? He started so many of his Holy Day sermons that way. Why are we here? very important question, and it's a question that can be asked so many times that we think, oh, well, I know why I'm here. It's because it's a holy day or because it's a Sabbath, but do we really internalize what that means, why we are here? It's easy to take these things for granted, these three pillars that I spoke of there, but it is critical that we do not take them for granted. These three pillars must be internalized. We must we must personalize these, uh, these pillars within ourselves with the help of God, and they must be acted upon. They must guide our behavior. Today I'm going to focus on the first pillar. I was going to, when I started this sermon, focus on the third one, but I never got past the first one, as so often is the case. And so uh, we'll focus on the first one. But I also want to focus on the fact that this must be more than an intellectual exercise. Knowing that God exists is one thing, but you know, the devil knows that God exists. And there are many people that, quote, know that God exists, but does it change their behavior? Does it guide their behavior? So we must, this must be more than an intellectual exercise. And what we do with that knowledge is vitally important. So how much are you in awe of God? How much do you believe that God does exist? In the January 2021, Tomorrow's World, that's the one that has the, uh, the picture of whatever that is, uh, the Great Reset, uh, the coronavirus and how it affects uh, the Great Reset, uh, the, the restructuring of the world, and there are people out there that are trying to do it, and we see a restructuring that is taking place in our world even now. But there's a, a very interesting article. I found it very interesting anyway. It's under the works of his hands, uh, and it says, Wired for Worship. And it talks about the subject of awe, A-W-E, of awe. And it, it really struck me in a, in a way uh, that I hadn't uh, seen it quite in the same way before, and I'd like to read the opening paragraphs, the first two paragraphs. This is an article, Wired for Worship, by Dr. Uh, Brian Fall. 
He says, several thousand years ago, a young shepherd sat alone in a field under a brilliant night sky. He looked up at the starlit expanse and was deeply moved. It may have been during such a night that he thought of these lines. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? That's a very important question. What is man? Why are we here? What's the purpose? And when you look out at the great expanse of the universe, how teeny and tiny and small and insignificant we are. When we look up into the night sky, basically what we see is our own galaxy, the stars in our own galaxy. Now with telescopes, we reach out and we see that there are billions of galaxies. Some, a while back, they, they estimated something like 200 billion or was it trillion galaxies, billion galaxies, I guess, and now they're talking about one or two trillion galaxies, each with billions of stars in them. And when you, you consider how gargantuan the universe is, David had no idea. David couldn't know how big the universe was, but he could see enough that he was impressed by it. And he could see how tiny and how small as he was sitting out there all by himself with sheep around him, and looking up into the night sky, and he was in awe of what he could see. And thinking about the God that created it all. I don't even know if he understood, and I'm not trying to put David down, but I don't know if he would have understood that those little bright lights up there are the suns. They were, that our sun was one of those little tiny lights. I don't know if they knew that back then or not. Maybe they did. But they could not know what we know today. And yet, at that time, there was some consciousness of God, oftentimes pagan gods, but in Israel there was a consciousness of God, of the true God. And certainly David understood that. But now we can see the vast universe, and we think it all just happened by chance. And we take for granted the dirt underneath our feet. But that dirt underneath our feet had to come into existence through laws. As I've pointed out before, that seems pretty solid. But scientists tell us it's not so solid. It's mostly space. We can't put our finger through it, but it's mostly space. It's atoms, very small, tiny, which are mostly space, and they're held together a certain way. You feel like you're sitting on your seat right now. Well, in reality, you're not. You're not touching that seat. You might say, oh, wait a minute, I know that I am. Well, I don't know. Maybe they don't know what they're talking about, but scientists say, really, you're not. What you're doing is your atoms are pressing against their atoms, and you're hovering over that seat, although very slightly. Uh, and that's hard for our, us to comprehend. But scientists aren't totally without understanding and knowledge, and really it just shows how complex this whole universe is, and there, it's based on laws and, and uh, uh, everything working together. You look at the, the chemical chart of, of the, the various things, and you find that they're atoms, and they're, they're made up of uh, you know, uh, protons, electrons, and the combination of those uh, determine what something is, whether it's gold or silver or hydrogen. All those laws that bring things together, and that had to come to existence at one point in time, and scientists believe that. They recognize the Big Bang, as we call it, or the, the uh, expansion theory, the uh, cosmic expansion, I think there's another term for it, that it just suddenly came into being. Now they've got to try to figure out, well, okay, that means there's a beginning. That means that there was something that caused it. What was that cause? There was a time when this didn't exist. And now it does. This shepherd was destined for greatness as the future king of Israel. Yet he never lost touch with that early sense of wonder and meditating on God's greatness in his own relative smallness. On that quiet night in particular, young David felt awe. I would certainly recommend reading this article uh, if you haven't done so already 
or thinking about what the significance of it is. You know, and there was another occasion when David certainly felt awe, and that is in Psalm 139, a very familiar passage for us. I think it's familiar to most of us. It's certainly one that I have focused on in more recent years, uh, simply because of some of the studies that I've done uh, in, in the complexity of life. But here in Psalm 139, and we'll begin in verse 13 through 15, it says, For you formed my inward parts. David is pointing to God, you, capital Y there, uh, capital U, uh, form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. We all began there in our mother's womb. I will praise you, David said, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lower parts of the earth. So God created the laws by which the body grows, starts out with two cells, two cells, the smallest and the largest in the human, uh, human bodies. And those cells turn into four and then, you know, eight and, and 16 and so forth. And, and some of them go one direction and form a kidney or a lung or something else. And some go in a different direction and form a liver. I've asked the question to a number of microbiologists or scientists, and I've never gotten a full answer, but we, we think of the kidney bean because it's shaped like a kidney, it has a certain shape to it. And, and I've often wondered, why does the kidney have that shape? We know that it expands, the, the cells keep reproducing, reproducing, reproducing until uh, there's a hormone or something that comes along and says stop, so it stops it from growing. But why does it have the shape that it does? Why does the liver have the shape that it does? Why does the heart have the shape that it does? What is the overall construction? We, we, we know it's DNA, but what causes it to take the shape and the structure that it does? Why do we have two nostrils? And you know, all the different things when you think about it, about the human human body, or any uh, living creature. You know, fearfully and wonderfully made, he was in awe of God. In the magazine, on the, um, the uh, uh, pillars that I, I mentioned there, I quoted two of my favorite quotes. Uh, one of them's more recent than the other, but the, the first one is from a book that I, I've recommended before, but I, I just absolutely love it, Michael Denton, Evolution of Theory and Crisis. There's one still a theory and crisis, and both Mr. Smith and I agree that it's, it's pretty deep, and it's not that it's inaccurate, but you have to wade through a lot of stuff before you finally kind of figure out what he's saying, and I wouldn't recommend that. But the, the early one, Evolution of Theory and Crisis, about 30 years old. You might say, well, that can't be very up-to-date. Well, it's still up-to-date, even more so today. The more we learn, the more up-to-date it is. But in this, I quoted from Michael Denton's book, and one of the quotes is this. He says, although the tiniest bacterial cells, let me just turn to page 250 because I want to I wanna read it directly there because I left a little bit out of it. I find this such an important one that I've underlined a portion of it, and then I put three stars beside it. I put a star beside something if it's really important. But he says, molecular biology has shown that even the simplest of all living systems on Earth today, bacterial cells, are exceedingly complex objects. Now, this is the simple cell that scientists talk about because they always talk about it started out as a simple cell and became more complex. And he says, even the simplest living system on Earth today, bacterial cells, are exceedingly complex objects. Although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, weighing less than 10 uh, to the minus 12 grams, so whatever 
the weight of a gram is. I was going to look that up before I left, how many grams in an ounce, pretty small. But that means that it's, it's a one followed by 12 zeros. Uh, that's how much smaller it is, or that's, that's how many of those it would take to make a gram. So we're talking about something, obviously. We, we don't have to know that fact uh, to know that our cells are very small. But it says, each, in effect, is, in effect, a veritable micro-miniaturized factory. And that is not an over-exaggeration. You can find evolutionists. Now, Michael Denton is no longer an evolutionist. I don't know if he ever was, but he's certainly not. But you can find evolutionists that will describe the cell as a factory. There's, there's one video out there where he shows a, a chemical plant in the background to show just how complex a cell is. It's a micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery. And evolutionists use those terms, molecular machines or protein machines, because they work, they do things. Made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated, and this is the part that I want to get to far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. The simplest bacterial cell is more complicated than any machine ever built by man. And Michael Denton is not the only one, basically, that is saying that. The more they look into the cell, the more they see how complicated it is. And yet we're to believe that it somehow just came into being on its own. Okay, my next quote, the one that I find also uh, quite interesting. This is one from The Body by Bill Bryson. Uh, this is, I believe, his newest book. And uh, another one is A Short History of Nearly Everything. Mr. Ames and I have both quoted from that uh, by Bill Bryson. But this is a more recent one. It's quite a thick book, but you don't have to go very far into it. And I quoted this in the article. He says here, <clears throat> he says, but of course it hardly really matters. No matter what you pay or how carefully you assemble the materials, you're not going to create a human being. Now here is an evolutionist, and believe me, he is an evolutionist. And yet he says that you're not going to create a human being. You could call together all the brainiest people who are alive now or who have ever lived and endow them with the complete sum of human knowledge, and they could not between them make a single living cell, never mind a replicant of Benedict Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch uh, an individual that he refers to earlier. You, the, the most brainy people in the world with all the sum of human knowledge and they can't make a single cell. My friends, how in the world, if we can't do it with all the knowledge we have, how in the world could that just somehow come to be? Now, I know that disproving evolution doesn't prove God, but what alternatives are there? If we didn't evolve, if there's no natural explanation for us, then there must be an unnatural explanation, you might say. A supernatural explanation for us. Look at what Solomon studied in his life. Let's go to 1 Kings, the fourth chapter. 1 Kings 4. In verse 32, it says, he spoke 3,000 proverbs. You see, that's the way that they considered a person of, of great intellect at that time. Today, if you know a lot of facts about everything without any context, you know, trivia, you're considered really bright and smart. Uh, different... Uh, you may know nothing of the context and not have ways of putting together, but anyway, he knew 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He wrote songs. He was a, a musician in that sense, or uh, one who, uh, a composer. 
He spoke of trees. Notice, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even for the hyssop that springs out of the wall. So the great trees and then those that are uh, not considered all that important. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish, and men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, why does God put that in the scriptures? You know, there, there are no doubt a number of reasons why he does. But he shows here that Solomon was a knowledgeable person about the things around him. He knew about the things around him. We look today at our little cell phones, smartphones, and not realizing that, I, I guess we realize that the phone isn't smart. It was the human beings who programmed it, who made it, who put it all together. And it, it didn't just come into being all on its own. It can't replicate itself like a cell can. But anyway, uh, we, we look at that as being so, so, so smart and intelligent and everything. But we don't go out and we don't see the stars as much anymore. When I go for a walk at night, I, I can see Orion up there. I can see the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and Cassiopeia. And, but not every night. Because of all the light pollution, we don't see those things as much as we once did. When I was young, I remember many nights looking up at the stars and seeing the Milky Way. And we hardly see the Milky Way here. I don't know if you can in the city. And I'm not right in the major part of the city, but street light, you, you can't really see the Milky Way up there. To see the myriad stars like David could. But we, we look at things. We, we don't see the, the, the beauty and the, the wonder of God. Now, maybe we do in a little way. Uh, I know that we look at uh, the lizards that are in our yard, the squirrels that my wife wants to get rid of because they dig in her garden. And so we put out live traps. I don't want to hurt the things. You know, it's, uh, they're, they're God's creatures. But we see these little things, see snakes occasionally, a black snake I saw for the first time in my life uh, last summer or whenever it was, Beautiful, beautiful, shiny black snake. Just a wonder. I wish I could have seen a little bit longer, but it was, seemed to be afraid of me. Anyway, uh, the things that God has created, Solomon studied those things. And I find it amazing that people don't have the interest in all these things in the way that Solomon did and the way that other people do. Now, there are many people that do have those interests. I was watching one of these BBC presentations uh, one evening, and it was talking about mud skippers or mudfish. How many of you know what a mudfish or mud skipper is? Anybody know what they are? Okay, some of you do, not very many. They're, they're fish that can live on land. They can breathe through their skin, and they can take extra oxygen within their mouth, and the gills there, and they can live most of their life on land. And they live in these mud flats, mostly in Asia, but elsewhere around the world. And there are 40 some odd species of them. They're amazing creatures. Their fins are up closer and the ones underneath are tied together in such a way that they make a suction so that they can actually climb trees. They're an amphibian. And they're, they're rather remarkable. They live on these mud flats where the ocean is, so twice a day the ocean comes in, then it goes out. And uh, there, there's one species that, to get away from every, everybody else, and they can grow up to about a foot long, and there's some are smaller, but it digs a hole in the mud. And how does it dig? Well, it does with his mouth. It takes a big mouthful of, of mud and takes it out and spits it out. And it goes back in and does the same thing. And it's a, it's a U-shaped or maybe a J-shaped uh, den that it has there. And in order to attract the females, the males will actually jump up, uh, kind of force themselves up into the air, and they'll spread out, and they'll do all these gyrations to attract the females. And finally, they'll find a female that, that wants to mate with it. So then they go down into the burrow, in, not burrow, but they go into the, into the burrow there. And... 
she lets loose the eggs and he fertilizes them in the, the J part of it, the part that comes up. And those attach to the walls of the burrow. And there's a, a trap there. There's air there. But then there's uh, the water that keeps everything from, you know, it's kind of like a toilet flushing. It's, you know, it, it's got a little trap there. So you always have water there. And then she leaves and the male basically takes care of the eggs. They need oxygen and underneath the ground like that, they don't get much. So it goes out and grabs a mouthful of oxygen and swims back down and then lets the oxygen into the chamber. And he keeps replenishing the air. So there's oxygen. Now, how did he figure that out? How did he know that these eggs aren't going to survive without me giving them air? And then at some point, he goes in there and takes all of the air out so there's nothing but water. He's doing all this with his mouth, which is quite large compared to the rest of him. And he takes all the air out so there's water because that's when the eggs hatch and they can then swim and swim out and live. Now, when you look at these things, we ought to be in awe of God. Because this didn't happen by chance. They talk about 15 million years ago, thus and such, they evolved this hogwash. They weren't that smart. They, they, they do those things because it was programmed into them. However God did it, I don't know. But he's programmed that into them, just like he's programmed the cell for everything to work together in the cell in a harmonious way, as though there was a brain controlling all of it. And until the mudfish learned to do that, they all died off, and there are no more mudfish. But they, they had to learn these things, or they had to have them programmed. They didn't learn it. There wasn't time enough, because how many generations? The fact that it took 15 million years, or whatever the time frame is, that just shows that they had 15 million years to die off before they figured it out. They, they, they look at time as though it's a, an ally, when in reality, if it took that long, then obviously they wouldn't have survived generation after generation. In Proverbs, the sixth chapter, Proverbs 6, very familiar passage for us. I actually read one time where they said that uh, this is not true, but it is true. Uh, in verse 6, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. And then he says, We ought to learn from this lowly ant. I don't know if you're familiar with cutter ants. You've all seen pictures of them. These ants go up and they, they cut off a leaf, a leaf cutter ant, and they cut off a portion of the leaf, and then this leaf that is bigger than they are, they carry back to the, uh, the colony. And it, it's rather a remarkable uh, creature. And let me just read a little bit about it. Leaf cutter ants. Uh, this is from McGill University up in Canada. It says, you may have seen the impressive spectacle of a leaf cutter ant highway full of millions of bugs carrying cut sections of leaves. By the way, a large colony can amount to eight million ants. That's a pretty good sized city. It says they, they cut sections of leaves, grass, or flowers back to their homes but did you know that leaf cutter ants don't eat the leaves that they harvest? This is interesting because you think, well, they're, they're going to harvest them and eat them. But if they're not eating the leaves that they carry home, what are they doing with them? What's the purpose of them harvesting? In fact, a colony can just about strip a tree in a day's time. They're very efficient. Well, what are they doing with their farming? Leaf cutter ants use leaves as their fertilizer to grow their crop. What is their crop? 
fungus. They cultivate their fungus gardens by providing them with freshly cut leaves, protecting them from pests and molds, and clearing them of decayed material and garbage. In return, the fungus acts as a food source for the ant's larva. The ants are so sensitive to the fungi's needs that they can detect how they are responding to a certain food source and change accordingly. They can sense what is happening with the fungus and they can cultivate it in a way that they have a proper crop. This symbiotic relationship, this relationship between the two, each supporting the other, also benefits from a bacterium that grows on the ants' bodies and secretes antimicrobials, which the ants use to protect their fungi. We just happen to have those. How many generations before they had those antimicrobials to protect their crop before they all died off? Adult ants don't feed on the fungus, but rather get their nutrients from leaf sap. Smaller adults often hitchhike on the leaves being carried back to the nest to opportunistically feed on the sap as well as protect the carrier from flies which can carry disease that, they, they, uh, that would be harmful and to check that the leaf isn't contaminated with other fungi. Wow, they know what is there and what. Now these, these are the little ones that haven't been around all that long, but they somehow know what to do. Now how, as, as uh, Solomon says there, they have no overseer, no guide, but they all work together and they know what their jobs are and they know what to do and nobody's teaching them what to do. They just, they kind of come out of the larva stage knowing what to do, depending on what kind of a, if they're a worker or whether they're a male that uh, is there to, to fertilize the queen or whether it be the queen, they all, and the, the little ones that ride on top of the leaves, which are on top of the, the, the larger ant, they know what they're supposed to do. They get some nutrients from the leaves, the, the sap, but they also check it out to make sure that there's no wrong kind of fungi there, and they protect it from the flies. From North Carolina State University, it says, uh, mutualism is a type of symbiotic relationship in which both partners benefit from the relationship. Leaf cutter ants cut various types of foliage into pieces. Then they carry these cut leaves back to their colony where they grind up the plant matter. Then they inoculate the leaves with a fungus. The harvested fungus is then used as a food source for the ant colony, essentially for the larva, not the adults. Apart from humans, leaf cutter ants are the only species that is able to make their own food. To protect these fungus gardens, the leaf cutter ants rely on a type of bacteria which lives on their skin to combat invading fungi pests. The relationship between the leaf cutter ant, fungus, and bacteria is one of the most amazing examples of mutualism in nature. You know, there are things like this. You, we could go on for days reading about the, the uh, mud skippers, about leaf cutter ants, about just about any creature out there and how amazing they are. How awe in God are you of what he has done? When I read about the cell, for example, I am absolutely in awe of God because I'm wondering, God, how did you do it? Not just proving that evolution can't say it, but how did God do it? Create a human body, or any body for that matter. It is so incredibly complex, far beyond what the average person even begins to understand. And, and, and I don't claim to be an expert on this. I, I can just see that, wow. I read some things, I don't always understand what it's saying, but I sure get the picture of what it's saying. There's a, an incredible mind behind these things. The problem is that knowledge can be an end in itself. Look at all the, 
biologists, the microbiologists, the zoologists, the people out there, the scientists, and many of them probably believe in God more than are willing to admit it. There have been some surveys on that. But nevertheless, there are many, like Richard Dawkins and others, who ridicule the very idea of God. And yet, there are those like uh, Ruse, what's the first name, uh, Michael Ruse, who admit that evolution is akin to religion. In other words, here's an evolutionist who is also a philosopher, and he's willing to admit, or was willing to when he was alive, to say that, you know, evolution really is a religion. And we must admit that, and then see where we go from there. He still believes in evolution, or did, when he was living, but he's willing to at least admit that. But knowledge of itself is wonderful, but it's not enough. Because there are people who look at these things, study these things, but it doesn't change their lives. It doesn't change how they view things. That's part of the problem with Solomon. Solomon had all this knowledge. He knew about trees. He knew about fish. He knew about birds. He knew the names of them. He probably knew their habits. He could point out just about any kind of tree, walk down through the forest and know what kind of a tree it was. There are people like that. Maybe no more or less than Solomon, but nevertheless, there are people like that. But in the case of Solomon, did it produce the right result? And what about scientists who know about these things? There are people a lot smarter than we are, who know far more on these subjects than any of us in this room or all of us put together, perhaps. But nevertheless, they don't get it. It's an intellectual exercise for them. In fact, they may even use it to try to disprove God. But knowledge with God in mind is profitable. So how real is God to you? Do these things affect you? Do they cause you to look in awe of God, to be amazed by what he has done? Let's go to Psalm, the eighth chapter, the eighth Psalm. The eighth Psalm and this was read in the article by Mr. Fall, Dr. Fall. But let's begin in verse 3. We'll go a little further. He says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Why would God even be concerned about us? For you made him a little lower than the angels, or for a little while lower than the angels. And you've crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion or rulership over the works of your hands. God created all these, these creatures and all this biodiversity, and he's made us to be ruler over these things. You've put all things under his feet all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Eternal, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth! Exclamation point. How excellent is God's name! How much we ought to be in awe of God. This passage contrasts the eternal God with temporary man. How great he is, and David is saying, why would you even be concerned about puny mankind? Only when we are able to see ourselves in contrast to God are we able to have a right relationship with him. Those that think that they're so smart that they don't need God, they can't have a relationship with him. There are people who get puffed up by knowledge, but those who humble themselves, who are of a contrite heart, who recognize their shortcomings and are willing to repent of their shortcomings and look to God with awe and respect and to fear God, those are the ones that are going to be in the family of God eventually. Well, we're in the family of God, in embryo, you might say, but 
born into the family of God. Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. And we'll go to verse 15. Isaiah 57, verse 15. It says, For thus says the high and lofty one, in other words, God, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell on the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. That's who God dwells with, those who have a contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Here is God who inhabits eternity. My wife asked me a question this morning, a question I ask myself all the time, a question that I even talk to God about from time to time. And I just finally come to a place where I, I, I have to say, I don't know. I don't think I ever will know until the kingdom of God is here. I think then we will understand. We can kind of understand going forward and never dying, but it's hard for us to go back in time. In other words, what did God do before he created the universe? Obviously, there was a time he created it. So what did he do before that? And whatever that was, what did he do before that? And before that? And before that? I don't know. I don't have the answer. I've heard people try to give answers. It doesn't seem to, to fit other than the fact that, that we have been limited by time and space in a way that God has not been. Now, <clears throat> what that means, I don't know. Uh, everything that we know is, is limited in time and space. And so we say that God does not dwell in time and space. Okay, that's fine intellectually. But what does it mean? My mind will not comprehend that. But I do know this from the things that I've studied. We are not an accident. We didn't just get here by chance, by blind chance. So where did God come from? I'll, I'll wait on that, the answer to that. But I, can, but I know that what I can see, what I can know, I know what could not have happened for sure. And there are a lot of proofs of God's existence. And how often, I don't know if you experience this, you pray about something, there's something. I, I find this happening a lot because my memory is really short. And uh, it, uh, it, you know, you asked me Monday what I spoke on today, I probably couldn't remember. I'll have to really think about it. It's just the way my mind is. I'm sorry. It's just maybe you're that way. But... I can be thinking of something and then get distracted and then think, oh man, that was a great thought. Well, I, I, I need that for the sermon. And, and you pray about it and boom, even before you finish giving a one sentence prayer, there it is. And you don't pray about it and it doesn't always come back. There's so many of those things, but how many times over 50 some years have I gotten down on my knees to pray for God to, to give me an eye? What, what do I speak on this week? You know, we used to speak quite a bit more often when I was first in the ministry. It was two sermons every Sabbath to the same people so that, you know, two churches, that's all we had were two churches. So you had to come up with a new sermon every week and a, and a Bible study during the week. We had those every single week, not just once a month or something, but every week and a spokesman club. And, and, and you, you know, you sometimes wonder, you, you pray about it and, and things come to your mind. And sometimes you start one way and it moves a different direction. But nevertheless, God answers those prayers. I, I heard Mr. Hernandez this last week talking about a couple absolutely remarkable, no way to explain away healings that took place down in Central South America. And as we were talking about, I said, you know, my experience is that God usually heals people who are brand new or who are isolated and far away. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't heal us, because we know that he does heal us, and we've probably forgotten all the times that, that he's healed us. But nevertheless, I'm talking about those spectacular healings where there's just no other explanation for it, and it was instantaneous, and we, we know of those, but we, we forget them. 
One of our ministers uh, out west uh, used to keep a chronicle of all the miracles that God performed. And one time they lived on the border with Canada and, and they, uh, they were going to the feast and his wife had canned a lot of things and done a lot of things. They had them in a, a little mobile home that they were carrying there. And they asked if they had any of thus and such. And she said no. And then he realized, oh no, we've got them there. And they, they examined the, the, the uh, trailer and they didn't find them. And yet they were all there, things that could have kept them from crossing the border. Now they weren't trying to deceive. They, they just, they didn't think about it until they were there. And they were going through the, the trailer. Uh, this, this is, you know, there, that was just one I remember them telling, but they talked about healings. They called, talked about a number of things. I've talked to people who, cars were, you know, died on a railroad track. I remember a family up in Michigan and there was another family behind them. And the railroad track was just at a slight angle and a train was coming and they got off, even though the car died and the people behind them said, boy, it's a good thing you, you got the motor going. They said, we didn't. Something pushed them off. Now, you don't have to believe those things. I believe it because I know who it was that told me and I know that they were not blowing steam. But we all have stories. There is a God in heaven. And we need to remember those things. In 1 Peter 5, we see that God looks to the humble. Those who recognize that God does exist and we humble ourselves before him. We stand in awe of him. He says in verse 5, 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. It takes humility to recognize there's something greater than you are. When you look at some of our so-called leaders in today's world, you have to wonder if they believe that there's a God because of their actions and the way that they do things. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Do we realize that God is the one, if we humble ourselves, that he will exalt us in due time? And yet, how many men over the years have gotten a bee under their bonnet, so to speak, because they weren't exalted when they thought that they should be. It's amazing how impatient we are as human beings. But you have to wonder, do these people really believe that God exists? Do they believe that God is the one who can bring them honor, that can exalt them in his time? So they may believe in God, but do they really believe in God, that he is in control of all things? You know, Paul used David's words in Psalm 8 to launch into the very meaning of life in Hebrews, the second chapter. And among other lessons from that, we have to come to that humility to where we really truly recognize God before we're going to understand the meaning of life. That's maybe a very side point, but just think about that and meditate on that. How real is God to you? How much are you in awe of the Creator God? So what does all this mean for you and me? Well, it's interesting that in the sample prayer that Jesus gave, we'll go to Matthew 6, he starts the prayer not with, God, give me this, God, give me that, but he starts the prayer focusing on God as our Heavenly Father. In verse 9, Matthew 6, verse 9, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven. So we look up to God as our Heavenly Father, as the one who has begotten us by His Spirit. He's given us 
a little bit of that spirit to connect up with the spirit in man, to change and to transform us. He says, hallowed be your name, holy, set aside in purity is your name, the name of God. And we say, your kingdom come, or to words that affect, God speed your kingdom. Your will be done, not my will, but yours be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he gets to give us this day our daily bread. So the prayer, the sample, very short sample prayer, that this can be the outline of a half hour, an hour, whatever it might be, 15 minutes. This sample focuses our mind, first of all, on God and his will and his overall plan of his kingdom that we can be born into. All of this focuses our mind on God. And that's why the article by Dr. Fall is really important the importance of awe, it sets the stage for everything that follows. How much do we believe in God? In that article by Dr. Fall, he says, awe, he's quoting a, a Dr. Summer Allen, awe may help stop us from ruminating or thinking on our problems and daily stressors. Instead, awe seems to pull us out of ourselves and make us feel immersed in our surroundings and the larger world, which may help explain its tendency to inspire generosity and a sense of connection with others. When we look to God with, with reverence and, and awe, then that sets a stage for other things that follow. And this is no doubt the reason that Jesus draws our attention to the awesome God and his great plan in the sample prayer. He wants us to think beyond the here and now and wants us to see a greater picture, a bigger picture of things. You know, when, when times are tough, as they are, for some people even more than others, and some of you have gone through some very heavy trials this year and in years before that, uh, it's helpful to know the big picture. And to put it just bluntly, let me put it as blunt as I can, you're going to die. I hate to give you that bad news, but you're going to die, and so am I going to die. But we believe that there is something else. We believe that there is a God who is in control of all things. We believe that God loves us and that nothing that happens to us, as long as we're, you know, close to him and all, nothing that happens to us is unseen by him or out of his control. And so when we go through trials, even those trials God either brings upon us or allows to come upon us for our benefit and our good. And so we can rejoice even in our trials. That's a hard thing. But if we cannot rejoice in our trials, are we really saying that God is in charge? Are we really looking at God as that all-powerful being who is in charge of everything and is taking care of it? God can take care of any problem that you or I have. You know, Passover is coming up. It comes around once a year. And we're called upon to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, I'm not going to turn there because we'll have this, no doubt, a number of times in the weeks to come. But in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 31, it talks about how the Corinthians were coming to Passover. Some of them were being gluttonous. Some were getting drunk. They weren't really getting the big picture of what Passover was all about. And so Paul had to bring them back to the purpose of it. And he says that we need to examine ourselves, and because some did not understand the broken body of Christ, some were sick and some were asleep, some were dead. Because they really didn't get the picture of what it's all about. And that's what I'm saying today, brethren, is that, and I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to anybody else, we have to get the picture 
of who God is, what we are, what his plan, what his purpose is, and we may not understand the answer to every question or why we're going through this trial or that trial, but we can know that he'll take care of it, that he's going to work with us, and he's going to get us through it. In 2 Corinthians 13, I'll turn over there, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, this is certainly applicable to preparing for Passover, but really it's for all times during the year. It says in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? His Spirit, by He's working in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, He's in us unless indeed you are disqualified. So he says, examine ourselves. One of my favorite scriptures is oftentimes people will ask, what is your favorite scripture? And, and you know, I, I've never been able to answer that question. I think this morning I finally figured it out after all these years. I have lots of favorite scriptures just as you do. But this has to be, you know, one of the top in, in my mind. Has been for a long time, but just never thought of it in this, this light. I mean, I've thought of what it says, but not as, is this my favorite scripture? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. This is Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, must believe that he exists, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must believe that he is, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. What a powerful statement, incredibly powerful statement. You could read what Mr. Salon was talking about there, I believe in the sermonette, uh, later on in the chapter, verses 13 to, to 15 or 16. We could go back and look to a previous co country, and that's part of the problem. We have people who have failed to recognize that they are ambassadors for Christ, and they're getting all caught up in politics and you know, gun rights and this and that and everything else and all the things that people get caught up in this world. And they fail to see the big picture. They fail to see God and what God tells us to do, and that's what we're to do. We try to take too many things into our own hands. It's an ugly world, and we can certainly rail against sin listening to the news on my way here. I think it's over in England, but a hospital where they have now removed the term, you know, breastfeeding or, or breast milk. It's human milk. Try to satisfy transgender. I don't even know whether to say transgender men or transgender women. I get really, really confused about that. Which one is it? But they're trying to you know, that's sin. That's not politics. Well, it is. They have made it a part of politics, but in reality, it's sin. I would refuse to say human milk. I'll say, you know, breast milk, breastfeeding, whatever, the old terms. Not to give in to them, but at the same time, brethren, we don't get caught up in the politics of the, the cancel culture and everything. We, we, you know, if you don't want to shop, some, that's fine. But we don't get out there and lobby for everybody to do those things, and what Mr. Salon was talking about is so very, very important because too many of our members have gotten caught up in these things. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You know, one of the reasons it's impossible to please him is because if we're unwilling to step out on faith, we're either going to violate the law of God or fail to do those things that we ought to do. Right now, I've, I've had a number of calls from ministers. I say calls, just in conversations have come up, where they say, you know, I have members in the congregation here that go to work, that go to Walmart, that go to Lowe's or wherever the place is, they shop, but they won't come to services. They want to listen online. 
You know, we, we have to have balance in all this. There are people whose physical conditions are such that it's probably wise that they stay, uh, you know, in the closet for a little while. But at some point in time, we all need to come out of the caves in which we're hiding, or the basement, or the closet, or wherever it is. And we have people who have vulnerabilities who come to services, and we social distance, and we wear masks. We try to do those things that are appropriate to be done, things to, to mitigate the risk of the spread of a pandemic. Uh, we wash our hands. We do the things we can do, but we can't hide forever. And I understand that everybody has to make that decision for himself, but if you can go to all these other places, if you can go to work and you can do this and you can do that, at some point in time, we need to come to services. And we took a very conservative approach at the beginning because we didn't know exactly what we were dealing with. But as we began to understand, we started meeting again, didn't we? As we began to understand more and the dynamics of conversations before and after services and all that sort of thing and wearing a mask, we said singing should be safe. So we you know, have a couple songs at the beginning and one at the end and we'll, we'll eventually expand that to where we get back exactly where we were before. And someday we're going to take these masks off. Now, there is a scripture in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, verse, I think it's 22, and verse 60 or 61, where it speaks of the pestilence that will cling to you. Now, that might have two different meanings. I can see different ways, but maybe, you know, this isn't going to totally go away. So are we going to hide out forever? There is a time. There is a time to hide, and there are scriptures that point that out. You know, go into the urn chamber, hide until the indignation be passed. There are scriptures like that. We are to be prudent. We're to be wise. But we also have to exercise faith. Not wild faith that makes no sense, but, well, I guess faith doesn't make sense but uh, to, to the, the carnal mind. But there comes a time when we have to exercise a little bit of faith, and we need to come out of the closet. How real is God to you? Because how real God is, is going to determine how we react to things, the decisions that we make. If we truly believe in Jesus Christ as God, coming in the flesh, we ought to be bold and we ought to be courageous. In Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, we are told to come boldly before the throne of God. And we are told to cast all of our cares upon him. So we are to come boldly requesting God to protect us, to give us help as long as we're doing our part, which is reasonable. Over in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, let's turn there, verse 5. It says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do we believe in God? Do we believe that statement that he will never leave us nor forsake us? So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Remember those who rule over you, who spoke, have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Then verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. When we read all the examples of his interventions in the past, he's the same Jesus Christ that he is, was then, he is today. And we can go boldly before that throne of grace and cry out to him for the things that we need or we think we need. And yet in the end, as all the prophets of old did, as the examples in Hebrews 11 show, Sometimes God intervenes, sometimes he allows us to go to sleep to keep us from the trouble that comes ahead. But God is in charge. We have some tough days ahead of us. And there are two kinds of people in this room. I include myself. 
Those who will stand with Christ upon his return, those who are going to make it all the way to the end, and some among us will do great things between now and then that we could never imagine. Some of our young people may do some incredible things. We just don't know. The other category are those who will fall by the wayside, like the Israelites whose bodies littered the desert between the Red Sea and the Promised Land. And why? Go back to the fourth chapter, the third and fourth chapter of, of Hebrews, because of unbelief, because they really didn't believe that God is there. They didn't stand in awe of our Creator. The degree to which God is real to us will go a long way to determining whether we're in the first or the second category. God did not choose you to be a loser. He didn't choose you to fail. He chose you to win. But we need to look up to God in awe. We need to prove God to ourselves. Read the literature that we have, the real God, proofs and promises. Read the booklet on creation or evolution. Study some other things. I, I'd like you to read some of you. You might want to read the body. It's pretty interesting uh, to see the, how this person who's an evolutionist can describe miracle after miracle after miracle. In fact, he calls it the miracle of life and still not figure it out or evolution, or theory, and crisis. We can read all those things, and we can learn from them. But he called you to win, and so we must look up to God in awe. And we must cry out to him that he may be even more real to each and every one of us.